So there is growing interest in the digital humanities on the part of people in visual analytics. I'll come back to this a bit, but uh, the roots of visual analytics are really in intelligence analysis. And that is, has been something of a, a yoke around our necks. Really. This is where the, the money came from originally. But in fact, most of the people from visual analytics are information visualization people. We come from geography, cognitive psychology, a broad variety of areas. And so intelligence analysis was not our, our natural domain. On the other hand, it turns out that many of the problems are quite similar. They're concerned with the same complexity of uh, diverse and sometimes sparse data. Um, so it turns out that the experience that we had with intelligence analysts and that funding, and they, they are quite a kooky bunch, um, has maybe served us uh, pretty well in bringing it to other di to diverse audiences. I'll come back to visual analytics in a, in a second. I, I know that many of you, I think, are at least aware of visualization, um, but maybe not visual analytics as such. Well, when, I was, uh, when Aaron asked me to um, prepare some materials for this talk, I, I composed this image. It's something as a visualization person I can't help but do, is to slide into Photoshop and try to put together some sort of evocative image. In this case, I used uh, Google <coughs> images to, to capture some, uh, uh, some images of old paper and notebooks and so on, and pasted on some uh, screenshots of some of the tools I've made over the years on top to try to get a, a sense of perhaps what a digital humanities visualization desktop might look like at some point in the future. Uh, perhaps the key thing to take from this is not the imagery as such, but the intimacy with which interaction uh, and representation flow with the way one works in a system. Um, the way we deal with information today is, is externalized. We work with texts, um, we work with our notes, we work with imagery. It may or may not be online, but it's a diverse collection on a, on a set of devices or on, on physical media, and that's something that's difficult because it's largely not accessible to computation, which means it's not accessible for visualization. Visualization necessarily depends on having digital data and some sort of computational capability. On the other hand, the goal of visualization is not to force computation upon a scholarly process. It's meant to augment it. I'm not really a digital humanities person in the sense that I don't have a depth of experience. I haven't seen many of the tools that are out there. I come from the, the visualization angle. And I can say, as something of a digital humanities layperson, that I see it as mostly still about data and browsing of data. That's what's digital in the digital humanities. Um, I think there's a, an opportunity here to take advantage of visualization to provide something of a complete digital workspace for scholarship along the lines of what I just described. Can we bring visual representation and interaction to the problems that are of interest to humanities scholars, or should I say the, the methodologies of humanities scholars that involve interpretation, narration, discourse, perhaps collaboration, and so on. Right now, we have isolated tools. Can we integrate them in a fashion that supports scholarship in a holistic sense? I decided that these are a reasonable uh, seven bullet breakdown of some of the things that might happen, perhaps not in the digital humanities uh, in all areas, or even in, say, computer science when we're studying the behavior of a network or the like. Um, but this is something along the lines of a scientific or a scholarly process, the, the steps and the parts that one might go through in the course of one's day. I'm going to focus on three of these three, three things today. Uh, dissection, interpretation, and narration. And by dissection, I mean taking some sort of a data set and pouring through it. Trying to piece it apart, compare pieces, look at pieces, see what's in there dig down into it in some way. And that brings us to the title of the project we're working on, Digging Into the Data. We're first interested in how we can dissect the data. So in this project, our goal has been, and this is directly from our Digging Into the Data proposal with Stanford and Oxford, by the way, 
is our goal is to initiate this notion of having a highly interactive augmentation of interpretive reasoning processes and to visually externalize some of those processes as well. To bring together the data and the materials that you might have with your own thought processes using interaction and visual representation. And here are the particulars of our project. Uh, Rachel Shadon, my master's student, has come with me today and she'll give a, a demo of some of our progress a little bit later. And of course, this is a, a collaboration. The collaboration is, is over in terms of funding, but uh, we continue to have a working relationship, particularly with our, our Stanford colleagues. Nicole Coleman, in, in particular, um, develops a lot of the tools um, for um, uh, the Republic of Letters, digging into the Republic of Letters project. And for the most part, we are developing new visualization techniques and tools. We are the technologists um, in this collaboration. Uh, we're not humanities scholars. However, this is a, a very good way to proceed, um, to have a partnership with people like Dan Adelstein and Paula Finland. They have domain expertise and understanding of their methodologies and their needs. These are things that we do not have. And while many computer scientists may not admit it, these are essential. That's essential understanding to have in order to develop tools, because otherwise we just create an implementation of something and throw it out there and it may or may not be useful. Right? There needs to be a, an intimate process of exchange between the domain experts and the technologists, I think, to succeed. So allow me, if you will, to give a bit of introduction to visualization. This, this uh, dichotomy here is something that we talk about a lot within the field of visualization. Not all of you may know this, but there's actually a group of people who do visualization. That's their, their area of expertise. Uh, there are major conferences in this, in this field uh, every single year. And we think of visualization as both a noun and a verb. So it is an artifact. It can be a static artifact, like Menard's famous map of Napoleon's invasion of Russia um, that is described so eloquently in um, uh, Tufti's books. And then also uh, at interactive examples of artifacts like uh, Hans Rosling's Gapminder that he presented at a TED Talk. Of course, that's a static image from uh, an interactive tool. What's it, what's it interactive about? Uh, it, it's an interactive with time, and one can also select the x and y dimensions that are plotted and the categorical data that's mapped into color. I believe in this case, color is the geographic region. And so, for instance, uh, if you were to animate this, it would play over the years in succession. And um, uh, for instance, uh, it looks like all of Europe is in orange. And one would see for each of these circles, which represent individual com countries, how income per person versus life expectancy evolves. Right. So consequently, one could see, for instance, um, things like the uh, demographic divide of all over time as, say, Sub-Saharan Africa um, improves in terms of life expectancy from, I believe, it's something like 1960 to roughly 10 years ago. I think I've seen the guy on television doing this. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Cool. He's quite a good speaker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's why I say famous TED Talk. Um, it's quite easy to find and well listened. Which group is your friend? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but visualization is also a verb. This is more of how we think of it in visual analytics. Um, so how do we generate, perceive, understand, and communicate these kinds of artifacts? And I've just presented a couple of images of, this was several years ago. Um, Chris North is uh, uh, one of the most important information visualization people in the world. And this is an example of a 50 screen setup in which he's tried to do dynamic visualization on gigapixel displays. Here's another example. Donna Paquet was one of my postdoc mentors at Penn State, and we're looking uh, using multiple different screens to try to look at um, geographic patterns of uh, hotel visitors moving around central Pennsylvania. I'll come back to that example. Now, unlike most graphical representations, visualizations attempt to depict things and the details of things in collections and also to make it readable. So for instance, that um, top image there of the mountains is in fact a visualization, not a very good one. Does anyone know what that, that uh, 
picture is visualizing. Any guesses? In fact, it's the stock market data over one particular yeah. day. I don't remember yeah. what it is. Of course, they've used yeah. the height of the mountains. This is, this is not a very good visualization, right? It's hard to read. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to read because there is so much superfluous detail. Similarly here, this, is, this was meant in fun. Um, it's attempting to um, use, uh, oh, which artist is this, Mondrian? Mondrian, Mondrian. Yeah. Um, to uh, represent a um, bus schedule. I guess it's supposed to be somewhat similar to the famous London tube map in that sense. I love this hurry if you want to catch it. <laughs> if one can figure out how. Now, visualization um, is tend to be thought of as broken down into um, three primary different areas, one of which is scientific visualization, perhaps the oldest. Um, and it involves very large amounts, usually of naturally spatial data, typically three-dimensional data, and often with time as well. And here are just a few examples. Um, of course, at OU, we have the National Weather Center. Their visualization is all about uh, the weather and gradients and storm evolution and uh, rainbow color maps, so hue-based color maps um, uh, and animation and so on. And there are also some facilities, like this is a drilling simulator for, um, for training the petroleum engineering students. Um, this isn't exactly visualization in the data sense, but, uh, but it is in the, the simulator sense, in the gaming sense. Second, perhaps, is geovisualization, in which the data tends to be somewhat smaller but there's often categorical data. If there's a, a split between the areas of visualization, perhaps geovisualization is not so far from information visualization. Um, it's a special case in a way. On the other hand, geovisualization, GIS, interactive mapping, and of course cartography go back a long, long way. It's something that I learned during my postdoc at Penn State, is that in a way, the cartographers had figured out everything long before we got here except perhaps interactivity. And these are examples from the Center for Spatial Analysis. So either of oil wells and their distribution in Oklahoma, a distribution of satellite tiles available in a large data set by one of our other faculty members. And this is an example I created some years ago um, of uh, it was the 2000 election, I believe it was. And then information visualization, which is in a sense my own home field. Here's an example of different um, visual representations. In this case, this is actually a representation of internet memes um, over some number of years, and they've used the, uh, something similar to the London Tube map to show that off. It, of course, is a tag cloud, which has become popular. I've yet to figure out whether or not these are actually useful or really <laughs> fun. <laughs> Did so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if you can, if you can see the large words, you can read the large words in the document after all. <laughs> this is a, a very clever technique um, called edge bundling that was introduced about five years ago, and it's very helpful to observe, say, in this case, the the um, connections between different elements in a hierarchy. I believe this was uh, uh, some sort of taxonomy, the Linnaean taxonomy. Of and then finally, here's an example of a, an interactive um, calendar. This is my own, um, taken from the, uh, a visualization that I'll show you in a bit, um, showing your ability to count um, the number of hotel visits, in this case, over time, and to see whether or not there are periodic patterns. So for instance, are there um, certain kinds of visitors visiting, visiting every Friday um, in the middle of the month? and so on. So you can dig into calendar uh, temporal data in a, a variety of ways to do so interactively. Now, visual analytics tries to bind these things together. So we're studying the visualization process and how it aids human reasoning. Here are two of the up-and-comers uh, in um, visual analytics. This, uh, this is Karsten Gerg, who was at uh, Georgia Tech with John Stasco, who's one of the very top people in visual analytics. Um, he's now at the University of Colorado at Denver, and he's showing off uh, their jigsaw environment for looking, at, in this case, at intelligence analysis or police reports in order to dig apart uh, relationships between people, places, resources, and the like. As a matter of fact, this carries over to 
the um, digging into data, the Republic of Letters data, quite directly. The, the perhaps the purpose of understanding the data is different, but the dimensions of the data and the analysis tasks are largely the same. And then Chris Andrews, who works with, um, 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 how should I say, um, immersive environments. In this case, they've got eight screens and they wrap around you and they've been doing some fascinating work that shows that if you are surrounded by screens like this, in terms of uh, Gestalt principles of design, the environment, your room, stops being the ground with the screen being your figure, but instead the screens become the ground and the information and your interaction um, become the figure. Mm -hmm. So it's much more immersive uh, psychologically. It's quite fascinating work and they're exploring how the layout, size of things, your ability to manipulate, and so on, uh, affects that. They've even um, rigged up the chair to act like a mouse. You can actually rotate the chair and rotate the mouse on the screen. It's quite <laughs> clever. So visual analytics in general, this is a definition from illuminating the path. How can we use interactive visual interfaces to facilitate analytic reasoning? So of course, we're concerned with the process of that. And in particular, there's the technical aspects of how do we represent and transform data? How do we represent that data visually and interact with it? There's relatively little work that's been done on interaction to this point. How do we produce, present, and disseminate results? And most importantly, how do we make sense of all of this information and the analysis that we're doing? And so there are many, many challenges. For the most part, the challenge is this, uh, in which we have an enormous amount of data or enormously complex data coming at us and we have to deal with things like the amount of data, uncertainty in the data, high dimensionality of that data. The um, Republic of Letters data has something like 15 dimensions to it. It's very hard to visualize that many dimensions in a coherent fashion. What do you mean by dimension? Um, if you think of a column in an Excel spreadsheet, so for instance, the first name of a person, the second name of a person, the source city of mm -hmm. a letter, the mm -hmm. destination city, the date on which it was written. Okay. So that's a, as a matter of fact, Rachel and I were discussing that coming up in the car. How do we describe it in that dimension to a person? It's a characteristic of a data record. And there are other aspects of scalability as well, most of which are largely technical, but we do concern ourselves with matters of social scalability or organizational scalability. How do you dem disseminate visual results or analytic results using some sort of visual presentation means? How do you um, encourage collaboration between people? Not just in the usual externalized sense, but how can you get people to work together directly within these tools if that's what they decide to do? What happens if you have multiple different users playing multiple different roles? I don't see in your, in your challenges um, the availability of that data over time, but do you see that as a challenge in this area, or is the data fairly temporal, and if it ceases to exist, it's okay? That's not something we concern ourselves with directly. That's a problem that I've run into many, many times. So we depend on there being, there, there's an underlying science of databases and data management and data organization that, that we, we try to take advantage of. Um, we're kind of agnostic. Once we get the data, we're quite happy. Um, and I realize I'm not answering your question, but I don't really know how, um, because the evolution of data is, is something of a, a social construction. Right? Um, so for instance, we've run, ran into the uh, problem when working with uh, um, historical geographers at Penn State, again, I'll come to that example in a second, that they did not want their precious data being shared <laughs> before they'd had a chance to publish on it, right? Um, these were you know, historical documents that they'd actually had to drive around Pennsylvania to find, and they didn't want to be scooped, right? So, so we had to be careful about keeping the data secret, not shipping the data with our examples, being careful about how we present the examples in our talks, and so on. So I agree, significant concerns. I don't know the answer to your question. I just wondered what your take was on it. Yeah. These are largely the technical challenges. Again, that's the, the angle that we, we, for the most part, attack these. these are, there are so many challenges here that it will take a long time to solve all of these, let alone all the additional challenges of, that our domain experts bring to the table. So what are the goals of visual analytics? Of course, we want information engagement. 
We want to be able to allow people to analyze proactively and predictably. To be able to communicate information and results and to make decisions about what to do about information. Perhaps the most important thing is insight. Do these tools provide some insight into the social built or natural system that's being studied above and beyond that which you would have without the tools? Now, can we create interactive techniques, tools, environments to power all of these? I see visualization as an essential glue rather than an afterthought. And in a way, we already do visualization. We do it all the time. We read our books. Books are uh, an exceptionally well-developed and evolved means of visualizing information. Okay. There's formatting uh, at multiple different levels. There's a sense of time and so on. How can we close the loop connecting people, data, and computation becomes the question. Then. If there is some sort of visual interface between us and the information, how can we bring communication into that loop in a way that serves the needs of the people studying the information and doesn't just serve the needs of people who like to write algorithms? As a computer scientist, I can say that that's the attitude much of the time. The, the iPhone? Yes, the yeah, iPhone. <laughs> But the, the iPhone 18, perhaps. Yeah. yeah, we're getting there. So let me go through a quick case study. I think this is about the 40th time that I've presented this visualization in, in a talk like this. This is from about 2006. Um, it's become something of a, a classic case study in the field of visual analytics. And we were looking with uh, David Fife, who at the time was a graduate student, and Derek Holdsworth, um, who's a historical geographer at Penn State, um, with uh, uh, Anthony Robinson, who was a grad student in GIS at the time. Donna Piquet and Alan McEachern are some of the top people in, in GIS. Alan wrote a book called How Maps Work, and Donna wrote a book called Representations of Space and Time. And it's everything that that title implies. Um, but we were working on Derek and David's uh, data set, in which we had um, a set of hotel registries, I'll go on to that here, such as this historic hotel registries for uh, around 1900 back to approximately 1898. We started with one, ended up with roughly four of them. These were hand transcribed of, with months of effort. I think David even said that his mother was transcribing some of this data at one point. Um, you can see how difficult it is. This is really messy data. There's illegibility, there's damage to the text, there's a great deal of uncertainty, there's even deception in some cases, right? John Smith. Um, potential deception, that is, or, or some form of surreptitiousness. And here's a classic uh, picture of the actual hotel. Um, there are places, there are people, here Dave and I kind of working on the display some years back. There are a lot of different data dimensions because we have space. We have geographic location of this, the towns that they came from and the towns in which the hotels are. Calendar time, that is the days that they visited. and. Um, abstract attributes or categorical information um, or nominal information, <coughs> such as the names of the people. We even had things like the number of horses that were stabled in a few cases for, for some of the, the data records. Many sources of uncertainty, and of course this is of real interest to real people. This is why this was uh, um, so um, favorably accepted in the visualization communities because most of the tools developed in visualization are toys. Right? Um, whereas this was an actual tool used by the grad student, used this tool for his dissertation and published multiple papers and actual analysis of the data. Um, and let's see here. I forgot to hook up audio, but maybe I can just turn this up. I have a short video, um, and Dave is talking about exploring some patterns of dates in the hotels. Look at AM sheets. Oops, sorry about that. Let's see if we get this right. Look at AM sheets. You can guess those come 78 times to this hotel. Uh, we see a very distinct weekly pattern where he's coming almost every Friday uh, with, with few variations uh, within that pattern. And if we look at the second person on the list, RA sheets, who has also come 38 times to see when each of them are coming, we notice that RA sheets seems to be coming, and then once he stops, AM sheets begins. So keeping both of these on, we see that there's a very 
distinct pattern of every Friday visits, but there are some variations uh, within this pattern where they're, they're coming on earlier on a Wednesday, Thursday, or even later on a Saturday. By turning on the fill seasons options, we can see that in this case it happens uh, in February, March timeframe, and by scrolling up and down through the list, we'll notice that all of the variations occur during the winter months. So this was a business hotel um, that most of the visitors were hucksters or draymen, you know, um, people with uh, drive carts or, or, or hawking wares. Um, and it turns out that Sheets is the name of a convenience store and gas station chain in Pennsylvania, and we think it's where our ancestors. It, um, David's analysis, where it's unclear what the relationship between these two people are, or indeed whether they were different people or not. It could have been a pair of brothers, father, son, or the same person who'd entered their name somewhere differently over time. The point is that this tool allows you to flexibly explore those different kinds of hypotheses to look at the relationships as you do that, without there being any sort of algorithm in the way to try to make those kinds of decisions for you. Can you express your, your, uh, your hypotheses simply through interaction? Look at me. So in, in fact, with the four different data sets that we had, we explored a wide variety of temporal patterns, um, and we were also able to, to look at spatial patterns, such as whether people were coming from a particular direction, from certain cities at certain times of the year, and so on. But for the most part, they were temporal patterns, and here are a few of the different um, temporal patterns um, that we observed for um, certain people. By the way, there were external other data sets as well, um, with things like occupation, you can see huckster, wholesale salesman, uh, and so on. So bi-weekly on different days. So one can start to hypothesize about the particular behavioral activities of commerce uh, at this particular time. Let me just ask you on that um, there. I mean, are you actually describing that as visualization? Mm -hmm. Because it just seems like a table to me. Well, th this, this is a table. This is, I would, it, it is a visualization in the, in the way that it's presenting information visually, but th this is what I mean by a visualization. That's something yeah, that that's what I thought you meant. Right. Moving parts and... Um, right. Uh, it's, interaction is not necessary for visualization, but it is a, a representation in order to allow a person to potentially see patterns that they would not otherwise see by looking at text alone. Mm -hmm. right. if, if there's one overarching purpose of visualization, it is that. It is to um, bring the human visual system and cognitive capabilities, particularly pattern recognition, decision making, hypothesis making, to bear on data in a form that we can actually take it in. I think interaction is essential for that because otherwise there's no way to drill down into the data to select certain areas of the data. Otherwise, there could be too much to take. So, I've uh, taken 40 minutes at this point, and that was the introduction. So <laughs> perhaps I should speed up a little bit here. Um, so, uh, so the, the hotel's visualization uh, was my work, but we've continued on um, since then. Let me talk a, a bit about dissection. That is, how can you bring visualization to bear on the problem of slicing and dicing your data in order to look at patterns um, in certain areas, at certain times, for certain people, and so on. So the questions here are, can we kind of visually infuse the process of dissection? How you take your information and actually tease it apart? Can we facilitate pattern discovery? And can we do it across scales and with different dimensions? Can we allow you to express complex questions as well? Most visualizations don't allow you to express very complex questions. They allow you to say, turn on the animation, or scroll to this portion of the screen, which, or to this portion of space, or to this um, range of dates on a calendar. These are helpful but they don't really allow you to ask complex questions. You'll see perhaps that uh, we, with some techniques we can uh, ask relatively complex questions, maybe of the sort that um, digital humanists would want to ask of their data sets. 
using simple interactions and representations. We can, in other words, we can pose pieces that are relatively easy to use, but with which you can actually act like a detective. So let me show you a few examples to give a sense. Here's an example of health data from Bulgaria. Um, Anthony Robinson, who was on the Hotels Project, went to Bulgaria and visited the health ministry and gave a talk, and then they handed him a CD with basically all of their um, um, health data for um, 12 years aggregated at the level of indivi individual oblasts. And in this particular tool, what you can do is pick a year, um, a category of uh, health variables, a particular health variable, do the same for the census variables and categories. You can also pick um, either uh, men, women, or both. And then see the bivariate pattern for the health variable versus the census variable um, over space. And so this ability to kind of explore the set of different variables that are in your data set very quickly and, and to explore over time, that the interaction allows you to, to ask particular questions about particular combinations of variables quite quickly. Here's another example. It's a little bit washed out, unfortunately. This is a, a synthetic data set um, of a scenario in a healthcare facility um, involving evacuation. And the idea is that each of the uh, patients, um, health facility workers, and the, the bad guys in this particular scenario, this was a, a, for a contest um, at the Visual Analytics Conference some years ago. Um, all of these people were equipped with radio frequency ID tags so that they can be tracked over time. And what we're seeing here is the ability to um, filter to see only those people who pass through a certain region of space. That's what that little lasso circling the yellow area was about. Or you can circle particular people and see the paths that they followed. You can stop the animation and restart the animation. You can even drill down to show only those people who were going at very high speeds or whose paths were quite sinuous, that is, they were perhaps panicked. Um, and this way you can hypothesize about the behavior of people and how they respond um, in space over time in order to try to find out what was happening within this scenario. As it turns out, there was uh, a bomb that was set off in roughly this area here. Again, this was funded by intelligence analysis people all there. Examples were always quite morbid like that. Um, but there, there were uh, a, a few so supposed terrorists we were able to identify by their movement behavior in this scenario. We were also able to identify the victims, some of the healthcare workers, and so on. Here's a third example. This one is, is quite recent. Um, this is actually, I probably shouldn't say it, but this is from a, from a proposal. Um, and we're, we're, but we're developing this visualization in order to be able to tease apart interviews with students um, graduating from the College of Engineering. And uh, what we can do is we can pick um, particular words or patterns of words that appear in the paragraphs in their interviews. We can also man uh, match phonetically and then read the individual paragraphs that may have occurred in any of the interviews and also see the interviews overall. And they are highlighted with the words or the phonetic matches that we want to see. And we can also see how those kind of evolve over time. So we've got something of a, this is uh, showing when words repeated themselves throughout. So for example, I can see um, the patterns of when, say, gender-related words are invoked during an interview, how they appear in clusters with other words throughout. And this provides a way for the interviewee um, in this case, someone who's studying um, education of engineers to go back and look in depth at how they responded um, upon graduation to various things. You can also categorize in multiple different levels. Um, there's kind of like a four-level um, tagging scheme that you can pick tags at each of the level and filter the paragraphs by those as well. Um, so for instance, you can look at just the paragraphs that have been tagged with career paths. Here's another very recent example. An independent study student of mine uh, did this last semester. There's an uh, Af Africa competitiveness report um, released with uh, roughly uh, 100 or 150 different economic indicators. And the student built this visualization 
um, so that you could explore um, relationships between um, things like business impact of different kinds of disease and the number of instances of disease. So this is a bivariate map in which the impact of tuberculosis is increasing green and the incidence of tuberculosis is increasing purple. So consequently, the very dark ones, Nigeria in this case, is, or let's say the Namibia, since this is a static screenshot, sorry. Um, but it's high purple, kind of medium green, it's this one here. And so we can kind of see the pattern of those two variables and how they relate. In this tool, you can also select with a lasso. You can select, for example, you can select uh, just uh, Eastern Africa or uh, uh, North of, of uh, Saharan Africa. Um, you can see different indicators. You can pick up to six of them to explore in addition to the two that are being shown as color. So for instance, the business impact and incidence of malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS. And we can see how those six different variables relate to each other. One can pick subsets of countries. One can filter down to say, I'm only interested in when the business impact of malaria is very high, but say the incidence is very low. One can filter down, see which countries are involved, how it relates to the other variables as well. So this gives you a quite sophisticated ability, in this case, to drill down into nine different variables at the same time. And so the technique behind this is called a cross-dimensional data dissection. The takeaway from this is that you can perform sequences of simple queries, or simple interactions, I should say. So you can click on data items and views, like you can click a country, you can click a person's name, and so on. And then you can turn on and off checkboxes in order to say, I want you to filter the people to sh who are, occur in the data with the countries I've already selected, for instance. And one can compose sequence of these things, in essence, to kind of slice and dice your data, to drill down, and to drill sideways as well. Because this is all interactive, one can, for instance, you saw it with uh, um, AM and, and RA sheets in the hotels viz, you can set up the filter that was filtering the calendar, and yet you're toggling between the two names and then pick the two names, you can very quickly see the variation of the calendar pattern for different combinations of people. So let me know if you're getting example-itis. Uh, <laughs> it's a, an occupational hazard of, of, uh, of mine, I guess, because I present many examples. The purpose, of course, is not to show many, many tools, but to show capabilities. Here's another example. This is actually something that I did with Phil Schroet, who was in the political science department. Here at the time, he's now at, at Penn State, I believe, he moved there a few years ago. Um, he was working on um, automatic and human tagging of Newswire reports. And he'd supplied me with uh, some data sets at one point. Um, basically, he, my sister was in the political science department here, Kate Weaver, some years ago. She's now at UT Austin. And I met Phil through her and got this data set. And we built this cross-filtering visualization. The capabilities are more or less similar to the hotel's visualization. In this case, though, one can see the temporal evolution of conflictual versus cooperative relationships in Newswire reports for international actors, state actors, NGOs, uh, and the like. And this is just a, a case in which I've drilled down to show one particular event um, in which Iraq was the source actor, the, the government of Iraq, the government of Iran as the, as the, the so-called target actor. Um, and here's a little bit of the details. The, the, the actual Newswire stories are, uh, are copyrighted. So we didn't have that actual, the actual source data. Now the interesting thing about this is that, you notice with the AM sheets and the RA sheets, we kind of had to toggle back and forth to compare them. That's a little bit tedious. It turns out there's a technique we can bring to bear that will allow you to see the many-to-many -many relationships between things as well. Let me just jump to this. This is, a, this is an example I like to show more often because it's a case in which everyone is a domain expert. It's movies. And this is a data set from the Internet Movie Database, but it's, it's very similar. This is social network data. We have movies, genres, the actors, directors, and cinematographers, whether they won awards or not, 
Also some numeric information, the number of times that something's been rated on IMDb, or the total box office take of the individual movies. What I'm doing in this case is I'm wondering um, how many movies, or which movies, Luke Wilson and Owen Wilson have been in together. That's a pretty yeah, complicated Bacon question. <laughs> you can play the Kevin Bacon game with this one, right? It, I, I can actually show you why the Kevin Bacon game is no fun with this tool. Now, it's the six degrees of separation game. Um, yes. Yeah. So, how, how many hops of movies, given an actor's name, how many hops does it take to get to a movie in which Kevin Bacon was? In this case, I ask people, assuming they watch movies, um, how many Owen and Luke Wilson have been in together? And of course, no one ever volunteers to guess because no one wants to be wrong. But occasionally, there's a brave soul and will say, oh, you know, they're brothers. They must have been in a lot of movies together. Well, it turns out that you can slowly, let me play this again, that you can basically build up this query with simple interactions. So I selected Luke Wilson, and I turned on people in the graph, and I selected his brother. And then I go over here, and I'm filtering movies on people. It's going to get fast. And now I'm selecting movies. These are just the movies in which either one of them had been. And I'm going to turn on edges in this little graph, this social network to see that behind, and behind enemy lines, Luke Wilson was in that, and this one as well. And this movie, um, Luke Wilson was in that one. And we're kind of seeing the, the blobs of movies for each of the actors emerge. And then I get tired of that and just select all the movies. And now this is every movie in which either one of them has been, and we can see that the Royal Tenenbaums is the only movie that they've been in together. Mm -hmm. So we've teased apart that many-to-many -many relationship between those two actors and the set of movies that they've been in. And yes, you can play the Kevin Bacon game. I can show you Kevin Bacon, all the movies that he's been in, all the people who've been in those movies, all the movies they've been in, and I can kind of walk the way out. It turns out that after a few steps, just two degrees of Kevin Bacon seems like, you know, a quarter of Hollywood <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. So you can see that that's uh, even though they're, they're simple interactions, it's quite powerful. Now, dissection, dissection is all well and good, but we would like a way for the analyst, the user, to be able to inject their own interpretation into the visualization as well. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but interpretation is at the heart of the humanities. It's a big part of what humanists do. They interpret information. When you do that, you want to be able to characterize these complex webs of structure in the systems that you're studying. And that structure exists in space and time um, and in the other data dimensions, the characteristics of people, for instance, and across scales, across spatial and temporal scales. The problem is that most visualization approaches are really targeting and have targeted for a long time the sciences rather than humanities largely numerical information, rather than, say, nominal or categorical or textual or just rich, complex data. So how can we start to, to try to get at that at least a little bit? In particular, can we take advantage of uncertainty, or at least integrate a capability to handle uncertainty into the actual visualization process? Can we actually embrace negativity? I know that sounds a little bit strange, but bear with me, that will, will make, a sense, make sense. We want to be able to ask not questions, like show me cases in which this person was not involved. Show me things that did not involve this particular city. We want to be able to integrate categorization in some way. It would be very, very good for people to be able to interactively and visually say, this set of people, I want to hypothesize that they were related in this particular way do more than just tag it, be able to color them, to be able to group them, and to see that and work with that visually. To do that, I believe that the, the, the way to do that is to, to liberate annotation. And I'll explain what I mean by that. I think we have a very narrow conceptualization of annotation. So can we utilize an uncertainty? Here's another example from the hotel's visualization in which a traveling vaudeville group, at the time this was uh, uh, vaudeville of Uncle Tom's Cabin in blackface, and with all white actors, of course. And they would sign in, um, one person would sign in, you can see this is the same handwriting, draw um, figures and so on 
this is clearly outside of the scope of what one would know how to enter into an Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> uh, the, the, the registry, right? This is quite hard to do. So can, we, can we somehow um, utilize uncertainty like that? Can we deal with incompleteness, variability, obscurity, potential duplicity? One of the things that Dave told us is that they had spent a lot of time cleaning up their data sets. They tried to guess these two names that look slightly different. The initial looks slightly different because of the handwriting issues, for instance. They would try to correct that ahead of time. Turns out if we use some good techniques, we can actually avoid that entirely. We can allow you to do that hypothesizing about when names are actually the same person within the tool itself. So the next person we look at is EK Hess, has 27 visits to the hotel. We filter our guests and can see that the temporal pattern is this even number of weeks between visits. So if we sort the guests by name, we can see that there's several Hesses that appear, and uh, several of them could be the same person, Ed Kigi, E.K., D.K. In 19th century handwriting, an E and a D could be easily mistaken for one another. So by clicking on one, we can see that it's the same temporal pattern as the other. So we can go through and actually select uh, several of these. And this verifies that this is probably the same person based on the temporal patterns. And this is an instance where we can go back now and correct the original. So integrating the visualization more deeply into the, the scholarly process of, of data collection, um, correction, interpretation, and so on. Do you capture those uncertainties? So, okay, so they're, they're, so in a sense we do. We're capturing it in the, the ongoing way that the, the analyst is working with. In a way we capture it by when he selects those multiple things together, that's an expression of that those things go together despite the fact that the text is different. Now actually capturing it in a persistent sense, let me come back to that. So, the thing about uncertainty is many of them are interesting in and of themselves. So we've got multiple cases in which they've left the question marks in the data set. The question marks are interesting. Of course, this is part of the transcription, but why was it that somebody didn't enter a first name into a registry? That's something that the historical geographer is interested in. So we would like to preserve the uncertainty both in the data representation and in the visual representation and try to indicate that in some qualitative way and perhaps also quantitatively as well. We can see that we've got the counts over here. So we can see that EK Hess had 27 visits, DK Hess had five. That disparity of number is also of interest um, in order to try to analyze this kind of information. The question is how much of that analog character should we preserve? After all, after all we're not preserving the original document that would be an image. We have to do some sort of digitization of it. And that's, uh, what, what do we do? What is full digitization? We don't really know what that is. So how, how much can we carry along? Can we put the uncertainty itself, whatever that means, into the data as well? The idea behind the visualization technique is we depend on the expert knowledge to define similarity within this visual analytic context. And we allow them to do it dynamically at analysis time not at data collection and preservation time. Hypotheses become just conceptual associations of items, transient ones. You can decide that, no, in fact, DK is really a different person, but EK and question mark K, in fact, might be the same person still, and explore that combination instead. So in addition to uncertainty, we should try to embrace negativity, meaning we want to be able to ask questions like, in the Cinegraph visualization, the IMDb visualization, which movies won pi Best Picture but not Best Director? Who has acted in both adventures and comedies? I know that, that that's a little negative. It doesn't sound negative, but from a Boolean logic point of view, it is in a way. Um, because it's in, in fact saying that we want action and comedy, and it turns out in Boolean logic, that's the same thing as saying not not action or not comedy. And these kinds, the way that we express uh, queries in these systems is through ORs. So um, even though I say embrace negativity, here I'm saying it involves more than just disjunction, more than just the ORs. Sometimes you want the ANDs as well. Or a complex question. This is pretty complex. 
Show me movies in which these two people acted together, but this third person had no role. Or all the other genres, kind of a complement um, uh, kind of query. How can we express those things? And more importantly, how can we express sequences of them easily during visual act interaction to allow an analyst to put together these queries in order to express their hypotheses? And what we came up with was a model called conjunctive visual forms. This is not yet implemented. But we can ask questions in the model, such as, such as this one, which is similar to the ones on the previous slide. And we capture the representational states, meaning the visualization, and the interactive <coughs> transitions, meaning whenever you check the checkbox <coughs> on off or select things, as a set of ruling formulas. I won't go into the technical details of this, but you can do things like, if you're on a map, you can select a set of things and say, I want the complement of what was selected before, or I want the or, or I want the and. And so you can pick subsets of things to include in your query, things to exclude, and things to ignore. And this allows you to express negation and uh, disjunction and conjunction as well. I won't go into this in detail, because this is, uh, if you're a bit too technical um, for the audience. Um, but you can use the same kind of visual interface. This is the one from the AMD visualization. But instead of simply saying, for instance, I want to filter movies on the Oscars that I've selected to show, say, the, the best picture winners, I want to filter movies on the not of the Oscars. So show me all the movies that did not win best picture. So, am I going too long? Can I, can I ask that now? I, I, if you don't, it's, it's 4.30, so we've got about half an hour. OK, well, I wanted to have a discussion as well. Huh? All right. I'll keep going for a bit, and we'll turn around. So it's quite important to be able to specify and evaluate categories. Many of us have probably read, for instance, Lakoff on the, the importance of uh, our categorization and cognition. And we integrate categories into our process, usually by hard coding an extra dimension of identifiers into our raw data. We'll add an extra column to our spreadsheet and say, these are A, and these are B, and these are C. And we'll do it at the front end. The question is, like uncertainty, like negation, and so on, can we do this dynamically in the visualization itself? Can we provide a way for you to say, you know, these cities look interesting to me. I think they go together. I'm going to call them hub cities for whatever purpose. Or these people are interesting in a way. I'm going to say that they were within this particular group together. Or I've read this external document about these people. I will go in a priori, select those people, and put them into the category. And that categorization itself becomes something that you can work with in an analysis as well. So if you can say, I want the A category, and I want the B category, and only show me the dates that were involved with people from either of those two categories. This becomes a powerful and indeed open-ended way to analyze data and also to impose interpretations about relationships directly within the visualization context. Right now, visualization doesn't do that very well. We can basically select a subset of things in one of the data dimensions we already have. We can select and highlight a subset of cities or a subset of people. We can't easily say then that we want those to be remembered as its own class, as its own categorization. Um, if we change the selection, we've, that's all we have. We have that one binary selected versus not selected categorization. We can do much better than that. This is an example in which we've got multiple categorical dimensions. This is migrant boat data showing different Coast Guard vessels, different kinds of vessels, different resolution, whether in an introduction or a landing, the names of passengers, and so on. One of the things that's missing from this is that we don't really have a way to say, hey, these particular um, incidents, these particular uh, boat events belong to a particular category. It would be nice, in an example like this, to be able to, for instance, lasso these or otherwise select them and say, these are of type A. 
and then have another view like this that lists A, B, and C, shows the number of events that we've selected, the temporal progression of the events that we've selected. We can get, say, A, B, C, and D, or whatever the categorization happens to be, select a subset of those, turn on cross-filtering of the map, and then see only A and B events. We can even go in and say, hey, A and B events look like they're related together. There's a subset of them. I'm going to categorize those in a particular way. You can build categorizations on the fly. So how can we do it in these kinds of tools? And the question I have is actually related to annotation. Because after all, what we are doing whenever we're dynamically categorizing like that is we're annotating. We usually think of annotation as being a label. Right? I mean, it's an and notation, like we're adding notation to something. Um, but why are annotations not also colors, or dates, or a number, or a count, um, or just about anything else? Why can't we annotate something with, say, an image? And in some tools, you can. You can kind of drag and drop things on top of a map, but they're an endpoint. Right? Or you have an image and you have some sort of a digital grease pencil and you can draw an arrow or circle something. But the problem is that these things are not digital anymore. The annotation is outside of the scope of, of the tool that you're using. Why can't we arrow to uh, create an association and have that association then be in the data and accessible to analysis, to this dissection? When we label something, that label should be something that we can select or not. Uh, later on, so that we can say, if we tagged all of these things in a particular way, I can later on filter on that tag and see just those things. That would be a very powerful capability to have. And part of the problem is that it's a graphical language problem as well. Um, even though I'll propose these things here, we don't really know how to do these things. We do not have, know how to provide some sort of an interactive language to draw arrows and have it be turned back into data. Right? In much the same way as we really don't know how to take texts and turn that into data. We have some ideas, mostly it's the brute force application of human intelligence to say here's a date, here's a name, and so on, but we're still not very good at it yet. The same problem applies here. If you just squiggle an arrow over the top or draw a diagram, we're very, very good at drawing arbitrary diagrams and expressing meaning with pictures, but we don't know what it means as data, or we don't know how to capture it as data, and that's kind of what we want to, we want to get at. How can we say this thing, these things, tag here or mark there? How can we be more expressive in our annotation? And by expressive, I mean something that's capturable. Right? We're actually expressing it analytically. We're expressing it as data through interaction. So annotation shouldn't be an endpoint. Um, in digital tools, annotations are really data, or they should be treated as such. And in a sense, all data is annotation. I would argue that this is the case. It can be coming from a text, it can be coming from an image. Ultimately, if we have data, we're either writing something down in some sort of discrete digital form, or we're capturing it from instruments that were designed by us to do that. There's some model that we've imposed on a natural built or social system and a means to capture this data. So it's all annotation in a way. And so behind this, the idea that we have is that of ampliation. Can we create a new kind of annotation in these tools that are open-ended, interpretation-driven, and are interactive extensions and modifications of data directly within the contexts in which we're exploring the data in the first place? No longer some other tool in which we're entering text line by line or cell by cell in Excel or Word or something like that. Can we actually do things like enter the location of a city by dragging a symbol onto a map, dragging it around, perhaps entering some text to make it more precise. Can we say these things belong in a group and I wish they were all labeled that way in our data set by selecting a set and then performing some gesture to mark them as such? Can we all do that? Can we do all of that in kind of this natural, visual, interactive manner? By the way, I take the word uh, amplitude. <coughs> um, I first heard this word in the uh, um, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, um, but it means to enlarge or to add to that which is already known. I think it captures the idea. Right? The real idea is not to just enter data. 
the real idea is to take the ideas and hypotheses that you have, the relationships that you see, and add it to the data in a first class fashion. And so how do we do this in visualization? To bring this back from um, concept um, to technology. In visualization, we talk about visual encoding of data attributes. So we turn names into bits of colored text on the screen, or times into points along the timeline. So we turn attributes into graphical form. We can also decode gestures. That is, we can look at where the user is moving the mouse, or the keystrokes that they're entering, or the multi-touch locations on an iPhone, and turn that into modifications or augmentations of the data. And we're doing that a little bit right now with our multi-touch devices, but it's predominantly navigational. Most of what we do with an iPhone is say, I want to scroll here, I want to zoom to there, or maybe I want to pick that one or that subset. When you want to actually enter something in the iPhone, a stupid little keyboard comes up, right? And you fight with your fat thumbs to enter something. <laughs> there should be more elegant ways to do that. Maybe not for text, you could speak it, but that would be uncertain. But for things like if you want to enter a location, you should be able to drag something over a map. And of course, these things are actually reflected in graphics as well. So can we do these kinds of things um, in order to decode the gestures the user is performing into data? By doing so, I believe we can vastly expand the range of visualization design. Right now, visualization is almost entirely about representation. How do you turn the data into an image? Right? It's very, very little study has been done about how do you interact with the so represented information and what does it mean to do so. So, Rachel, we have finally gotten to you. You never thought it would happen. Maybe you were hoping that we would run out of time first as I talk on and on and on. We're going to try to get a, give a couple little demos of um, how Rachel is using some gesturing capability. No. Do you guys have any questions or thoughts or comments while we're setting this up? I was just thinking about, as you're talking about the ability to use visual methods to create more data or to annotate data, just the technology movement where now, you know, within a few years in KD libraries, We'll be able to put tables out there with large touch screen surfaces and how powerful in terms of a learning tool it would be to be able to experiment with information and data in that touch and visual realm. That is just start, it brings things to a whole different level of learning. So one of the paths that I would like to take some of these sorts of things is to, so for one thing, there's this visual environment, all of these visualizations you've seen um, this is essentially the window that you use to build the visualization tool. Right? Some of these visualizations, like the Africa Competitiveness Report, that was two days to build that visualization, to implement it fully. Um, and if we can put this kind of high-level programming capability, design capability, into the hands of, say, an instructor, my deep background is in chemistry, by the way, and I have some like, periodic tables, kinds of visualizations. I would like to be able to hand off a builder tool like this to an instructor who can then build suites of visual tools to accompany lesson plans. Mm -hmm. right? To not only show the students um, a certain principle, a set of relationships, but to also allow them to essentially carry out a kind of experiment mm -hmm. or to actually interact in such a way that they can see the relationship forming under different circumstances. And then maybe even give the students a little bit of ability to, to interpret in the same way that we talked about, saying, you know, I noticed this here, I'm going to call it that. I'm going to notice this here and call it that. And then not only the students, but the instructor could come back later with that annotated data now and look at the students saying, I'm reporting, I'm seeing this and this and this at these particular times in the experiment. And if you drag molecule X and molecule Y together and something bad happens, it's not so bad. 
<laughs> right, exactly right. right, right. And, and as someone who's been knocked unconscious by getting a big, big whiff of ammonia, I can, I can testify to that, yeah. On the simplest level. Mm -hmm. So this is using the data set that we're working with and digging into data. It's the electronic enlightenment that Chris talked about briefly. And it is part of my thesis work, demonstrating um, using the, so the gesture interactions on uh, the relationship graph that I showed earlier. So let's, let's ask a couple of questions. Let's start with something like languages. What kind of languages were used? The most of the correspondence written in. So let's see. Mm. So we add a node, and that's an author node. And so, so, so what she's done is she's selected the five of the authors, and she's put this node into that that query graph there. It kind of says part of my query is going to involve those five authors because they all speak the same language, right? Well, we don't know. We're, we're kind of looking we're into that. Okay. Uh, so, and those are our. I, I sorted the authors by the, the number of letters that they oh, wrote. So, so those are the five most prolific, five most prolific authors, mm -hmm. um, and we want to know what languages they write in. Uh, but I don't really want to know about the unknown cases. So, so just pick a couple languages. Like, uh, I I figured we'd do all of them and then constrain the edge. Okay. Where did that go? Okay. Unfortunately, we can't quite see the selections there in that. Little languages table, English is selected, unknown is not selected, Latin, French, and so on are selected. Mm -hmm. You can see maybe, so when I select a node, it pops up here in the node constraints to let you know which languages I've selected. So I've selected all of the languages except for the unknown cases. And that's when it's entered into the record set as unknown or null. All right, so, so we're dealing with, we're handling uncertainty in a particular way by ignoring it in this case. Mm -hmm. Which is up to the scholar well, to decide. <laughs> um, so we want to see we want to see the letters, or we want to know which languages they were written in. So we need to connect these two nodes, and let's see. We want more than thirty because we'll call thirty statistically significant, and set it as greater than, and connect those with an edge, and that gives us. the languages these folks wrote in. Mm -hmm. So he's just off there. Yeah. I'm working on it. There it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm an English person, so I, I was, it was nice to see one. <laughs> <laughs> and if we change that edge constraint, so that's greater than 30, Greater than 30 what? Uh, greater than 30 letters were written in. Oh, so, uh, like this connection from Voltaire, he wrote greater than 30 letters in Italian, and actually, I don't think it will give me the cardinality, but if we click on that edge, it shows all of the letters in this bottom table that he wrote in Italian. Uh, looks like mostly to Marie Dennis. Well, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> Voltaire's prolific, a large portion of this data set is uh, Voltaire's letters. Um, but in the same thing we can see, so the ones he wrote in English were, uh, incidentally, to Alexander Pope. But we can change the, the edge constraint if we want to see maybe more of the letters. Let's say greater than 10. Why don't you do a query with multiple attributes, more than, more than two? More than two? Okay. Let's see. And we will switch this to there we go up 
take that language. So now we're only looking at languages, um, so either French or English. And we want authors that wrote to any known destination country. Soon. Sorry. Okay. Soon. We're, Sorry. We're, we're, we're more than a model. We, we also want to be able to do true ands in here. Working on it. <laughs> Soon it will come. <laughs> um, so this one's kind of complex. Let's maybe only select half of these so it doesn't overwhelm us. So that, that table of search results, you can select individual ones or subsets of them and just see the part of the graph. Mm -hmm. It's a hit according to the query. Now this isn't this isn't an annotation like I was talking about, but it is the gesturing technology that we're building into the system. The, the gesturing with mouse clicks and, and key clicks is what we're using to build the query graph up above. And we're using this as a as a research case in order to figure out how to build those things into the system. We also have a few examples of uh, actually directly manipulating things like a, a little matrix of, of counts. We can increase or decrease the counts directly within the matrix. Um, I've got another simple example in which you can enter text into a text field, select a subset of things and say, tag them with this, or select a color and tag them with that color, and that color and that text will appear elsewhere as well. And those are those are under progress and probably a little rough to show. So the tools that you you're using now for the, for the example you showed. How 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 um, and what how available are they, and what how and to use for additional projects? So so, so all of the examples we've shown are in my own system. It's called Improvise. It's pure Java, and it's available under the GPL under the new public license. So it's open source. And, and so I assume there are objects within that take the objects and recombine them in with new code or are you are you collecting people's new code so the, the code is <laughs> the building block piece right so there are two levels of building blocks really mm -hmm. there's the low level set of building blocks in java so mm -hmm. for instance here's a map here's a scatter plot here's a table mm -hmm. um, here's a means of interaction here's some other means of interaction mm -hmm. there's then a language with which one builds these tools like a query language. Um, it's similar to SQL, if you know what that is, mm -hmm. for databases, or it's uh, like vaguely similar to, say, macro languages in Excel. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, you work through direct manipulation directly within this user interface. You say, um, there's a dialog box, and you say, I want a frame here, and I want this kind of view here, and I want the data come to come from there to go into here, and I want it to be filtered with this set of rules and so on. And that's how we can build things in here very, very quickly. So there are two levels of building, and there's two levels of modularity as well. Other questions? So should I just wrap it up? Sure. Please. Okay. So just very briefly, um, the third thing that we're working on is narration. This is, I guess, really just going to end up being a plug for one of my PhD students. How can we remember the queries that we've performed? How can we understand those queries? How can we encourage collaboration between people and also engage provenance? That is, the history of what it is that we have done. Here's just yet another example of a visualization of Wikipedia edit data. That's a complex visualization. Um, it's got the same kinds of dissection capabilities that we've seen in the other tools. But the inter interactive interactions are simple. But sequence of interactions are usually only make sense when you're actually doing them. You can easily get to a state in a visualization in which you don't really know how you got there. Because you clicked a bunch of things and you don't know what question you were asking beforehand. So how can we really interpret a visualization that we see if it doesn't kind of explain itself? Right? If the explanation is really in what it was that we did to get there. 
can we capture the intent of the interactions we've performed in some sort of understandable form? It's easy to get distracted, especially as we go along. Let's get that. So my PhD student is working on translating these visual queries and sequences of visual queries into natural language. Basically creating a living, running log of what it is that you're doing in terms of the dimensions of the data, what it is that you see, what the individual entities are, the attributes are um, that you're doing. And so for instance, imagine that you could click on that um, date and see this. And then you filtered it to show only the authors who wrote something on that date. And this is what you now see. That's kind of, uh, imagine that it's uh, in a web page marked up as, as uh, HTML. You might sort them, so say who edits the most articles, or filter them further. At any rate, you have a sequence of interactions in which you're exploring things, and maybe you can look at many and many relationships in a graph, and then you see, sorry, this is from an alternate version of this talk in which I use Winnie the Pooh to, to convey things. For some reason, I took it out this one. But you can see there's a, there's a complex process by which this visualization state arose, not too hard to understand as you're doing it, but if you just came to this after the fact, you'd say, what on earth is it that I'm seeing here? Well, we're very good at being able to read in order to understand what it is that the question was. So we're doing this question generation. Um, I won't show you a demo, but um, she's got it working pretty well for um, names at this point, for nominal data. It's probably a topic for a completely different talk. Um, what we want to do at that point, though, is now we've got information about what I did or my colleagues did at certain points of time, um, what it was that I was looking at, and that's now additional data that we can also query. So wouldn't it be great if we could express a query like, show me the queries from last week in which I was looking at these visited places that I classified as subsidies. I have a strange idea that that would be a useful thing for a scholar to have. And I think with the combinations of things that we've both shown and then we're proposing here, that we can actually enable you to express those queries in a coherent fashion in visualization form. I think we're really starting to understand how to do that, how to actually build the thing. Okay. What else is there to do? A number of other things, but we're not working on those. So I apologize for going so long. I don't think I've ever given this talk that it hasn't run half an hour over <laughs> to this point. I'd love to hear any questions that you have or comments. Got a couple minutes left, so if there's any questions, uh, some of us will get a chance to talk with you. Absolutely. So you said your, your tools, your programming tools are Java and an mm -hmm. SQL type language? Or? It's an SQL type language, that's right. Yeah. It's, Rachel can testify that it's not the easiest language to learn, but the example showed that it's quite powerful. Um, in terms of creating examples. If you can learn to program in SQL and um, do graphical design of some sort, that is, you have some understanding of how to turn data into visual representations and are willing to spend, well, I don't know, a month or two or three <laughs> practicing with the language, then you can build visualizations like this. Right. Mm -hmm. And I missed the first part, that the students in, in your program are in Computer science? Is this a computer science? Predominantly computer science, yeah. Although um, geography is pretty common as well. Usually geographic information system students. We have a new program in G1 Chromatics that we're building. Um, so they'll get a master's in? A computer science or, or G1 Chromatics in that case. Right? So, so. Several, several years. Yeah. I'm wondering, other than gestures, have you explored or thought about uh, eye tracking or any other kinds of data input in terms of the user from the right. user side? Right. So we, we have thought about that quite a bit. As a matter of fact, I, I have two eye trackers. They're extremely expensive and extremely hard to work with. Okay. Uh, eye tracking or gaze tracking is is you know promise for input interaction for a couple of decades now, and it's yeah. still not really going. Into that's really quite terrible to work with. Um, it is, for assistive purposes, it's excellent because there are a few other options. Um, 
part of the problem is that gaze tracking has a very poor resolution. You can't really use gaze tracking, for instance, to select that 10 pixel by 10 pixel yeah. thing. What you can use it for is to know whether or not a user is looking at one of these views at any given time. So if you have a visualization like this, I can tell with gaze tracking whether you're looking at this or this or this. Now the interesting thing is, and this is a project that we're going to start working on, is that when you're working in a visualization like this, unlike almost every other user interface, you are often looking there and interacting there. Most of the time we're looking where we're interacting, more or less, or we're constantly kind of reacquiring. Whereas in these uh, interfaces, you might be sliding something and watching the result of the sliding change. So you've got a gaze, you've got kind of the, the gaze attention and you've got a motor attention as well with the hands. Now that's two channels of information of intent that we can start to exploit. If I know that you're performing interaction X over here and yet you're looking over there, I know a lot about what kind of query you're thinking of but you're not actually fully expressing in the, the interaction. So, so yes, but we haven't looked at things like connect, right? And how can you kind of dance to, to enter queries? But it's, it's a relevant question though, because we're talking about, in a way, if you're trying to, um, if you're entering categories or you're moving cities around, or maybe you're trying to express the shape of a region in which something is happening in a historic map, you want a more flexible way to express shape Right? And we really don't have that. A mouse is a, is a point or maybe a path, if you're lucky. So we, need, we do need those kinds of interactions. We're just starting to explore what the gestures might be in the first place. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Chris. Really yeah, I feel right daunted. <laughs>